Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. I am Karen Francis, the Vice President and Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer for the American Institutes for Research. I am a black woman of Jamaican heritage. I am wearing glasses, a checkered dress and a brightly colored pink sweater today. My pronouns are she, her and hers. I am delighted to join this event today from my home office in Olney, Maryland, surrounded by many artifacts that I've collected from my travels that bring me real joy. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. AIR and our AIR Access Employee Resource Group are delighted to host this event today with our distinguished guest, Judith Human. We're also joined today by Kathleen Murphy, who will be our, our moderator. Kathleen is a principal researcher at AIR who has worked in the field of disabilities research and knowledge translation for well over 15 years. She leads AIR's Individ Individuals and Disabilities Practice Hub, is an active ally of AIR Access Employer Resource Group, and a long-standing fan of Judith. So special thanks I want to say to an another one of AIR's Disability Hub and Access ERG members, Tracy Bauman. You who work with Kathleen on arranging today's events, disability-oriented accommodation. So thank you so much, Tracy. And with that, I'll say without further delay, it is my pleasure to turn this over to Dr. David Meyer. So David. Thank you, Karen. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And I wanna thank everybody else for being here today. Uh, October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and this year's theme is disability, part of the equity equation. And for the AIR employees, I think they all understand the importance of the word equity. It appears in our mission and uh, throughout our work. It's during this month that employers and disability advocates are recognized for their innovative approaches to fostering supportive, mental health-friendly workplaces. At AIR, Awareness Months are a great opportunity for us to educate and raise awareness. And I'm proud that we're able to bring you today's speaker through the combined efforts of the Access Employee Resource Group, as well as our Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. The United States has evolved significantly from seeing persons with disabilities as objects of pity, charity, ridicule, or rejection to this year marking the 32nd anniversary of the signing of Americans with Disabilities Act. This bill was signed with a proclamation by then President George Bush that, quote, we let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. Equity begins with inclusion, but it doesn't stop there. AIR is an institution that's deeply focused on equity. Through our mission of contributing to a better, more equitable world, we're pursuing equity across all dimensions of identity, including those places where identities come together or intersect. And I think this intersection, the notion of intersection is particularly important. The American civil rights advocate and scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, first introduced us to the concept of intersectionality more than 30 years ago. And it's defined as the ways in which systems of inequality based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, class, and other forms of discrimination intersect <clears throat> to contribute to dynamic effects, uh, to different dynamics and effects. Intersectionality suggests that all forms of inequality are mutually reinforcing and must be addressed simultaneously to present one form of, uh, to prevent one form of inequality from reinforcing another. In any conversation we have around equity, including the one we are about to have today, I encourage us to be conscientious of the fact that all movements, such as those for social justice, feminism, disability rights, have intersectionality and that work must be done to include diverse voices in addressing these barriers, ameliorating harm and achieving restoration. With that, I'm pleased to introduce an icon of the disability rights movement, known by some as the mother of disability rights, Judith, human. Now, earlier before we started this, I asked Judith if it was okay to refer to her as Judy. So I've been given permission. We can refer to her as Judy Human. Judy is a lifelong advocate for the rights of disabled people. She contracted polio in 1949 in Brooklyn, New York, 
and began to use a wheelchair for her mobility. She was denied the right to attend school because she was considered a fire hazard at the age of five. Her parents played a strong role in fighting for her rights as a child, but Judy soon determined that she, working in collaboration with other disabled people, had to play an advocacy role due to continuous discrimination. In 1977, Judy helped lead a groundbreaking protest called the Section 504 Sit-In, in which disabled rights activists occupied a federal building for almost a month, demanding greater accessibility for all. She's been a tireless advocate for disability rights in the United States and abroad, having served in the Clinton and Obama administrations and was the World Bank's first advisor on disability and development. In 2020, in her 2020 memoir, Being Human, an unrepentant memoir of a disability rights at activist, she shares the story of her struggle for equality and her rise as a fierce disability rights activist. We hope today's conversation will illuminate how organizations can develop a fully inclusive workplace for people with disabilities and how AIR and its partners can foster greater equity in community with and for people with disabilities. I want to say one more thing. It, I, I reflect 13 years ago, when I became CEO, we only talked about diversity. Then we learned that we had to talk about inclusion and diversity. And in recent years, we've now expanded the way we think about this. And I'm really proud of AIR to say that we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think just in a simple way, that reflects how we've evolved as an institution in the last decade or so. So let's begin the conversation Judy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you very much. And let me thank David Osher. Also, I've been friends with David since, I don't know, 1993, maybe even before. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm happy to engage in this discussion today is because for me, AIR is an important organization, not only looking at the theme for this month of uh, employment of disabled people, but the fact that AIR has for many years uh, gotten funding from various governmental agencies doing work in the area of disability. And in our discussion today, I think one of the important issues we need to be looking at is beyond AIR and the work that it's doing, which is critically important internally, what it's doing for its staff who have disabilities, recruitment, retention, advancement. Um, it's also very important to look at what it is that you're learning from what you see in the various programs you're working in that are focusing on issues affecting disabled people and what greater systemic changes need to be made to really enable the institutions outside of AIR to also become more responsive uh, to the needs of disabled people. So let's go forward. Kathleen, are you kicking sure. it Sure, yeah, I am. Thanks, Judy. Um, so any of you who might just be joining us, I was introduced earlier, but my name is Kathleen Murphy. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm going to be uh, moderating today's event and having a, a nice conversation, I hope, with Judy Hibben. I'm a white woman with shoulder length blonde hair, and I'm wearing a off-white sweater over a black and white pattern dress. So Judy, I mean, I think you already know we're all really delighted to have you here as AIR's celebration of the National Disability Employment Awareness Month. A lot of people call it NDEAM, if you ever heard that term. And um, a lot of you submitted questions as part of your registration. So we really appreciate that and have tried to synthesize them and put them into the questions that will be, um, that we'll be framing the conversation that we're gonna have today with Judy. Um, so Judy, you've, you know, it is Employment Awareness Month. So we thought about that you've worked in a variety of settings. You made amazing contributions in all of them. I think a lot of people in the audience have seen your Oscar nominated 
documentary film Crip Camp. We had a watch party at AIR for it. Um, not everybody may be aware that um, you have a fantastic memoir called Being Human, an unrepentant memoir of a disability rights activist. I love the subtitle. It's a really great read. And there's a lot of really compelling personal stories in there that I think can help enlighten our audience about some of the issues that you just raised. Um, so if we started just with your story at first, and you know, there's like a familiar line people have once upon a time there was, and in this case, it's a little girl born in Brooklyn. So how would you continue? What do you think people should really understand about disability? Just starting, we'll get into other issues, but starting from your own perspective. Sure, and we have to admit, thanks a lot, Kathleen. So uh, let me give my description. I'm a white, almost 75 year old, disabled woman. I have brown shoulder length hair with some highlights in it. I'm wearing a purple sweater um, with a multicolored um, necklace that someone gave me from Brazil. And we are in uh, my husband's in my apartment and we have many photos um, around on our walls and other knickknacks and our dining room table, which also is our office during the day and two employees who are working around the table and a lot of plants. Um, so I have to start off by saying my passport says I was born in Philadelphia, which is true. So I lived in Philadelphia for three months, but I actually, not that I don't like Philadelphia, but I lived 25 years in Brooklyn. And uh, my parents were German Jewish immigrants uh, from, uh, and lost, their parents on both sides and other relatives. And I think it's very important to talk about families as immigrants because um, their first language was not English, although they both did learn English pretty quickly, but um, they grew up in a country obviously where there was significant discrimination and coming to the United States without their families was a major life-altering experience. So in work that AAR and others do around issues of immigrant families, I think it's very important when including disability uh, in those families that there are multiple issues that people are having to deal with. I was, um, I think, pretty fortunate in many ways that my parents early on, in spite of the fact that a doctor recommended that I be placed in an institution when I was two years old, really um, decided that that was not the road they were going to travel on. And I can speculate many reasons why, but at the end of the day, they decided that they were going to keep me in the family. And they had no idea, you know, when I was 18 months old and um, had polio, what that was actually going to mean. Um, and I think like, not just uh, parents of kids with disabilities, but um, people who acquire their disabilities as they're getting older, you don't necessarily really understand the barriers that you're gonna experience. And in the area of disability in the 40s and 50s, there were no laws in place. I think that's very important. Even with laws in place, people frequently don't know about the laws and if they've heard of them, they don't know how to utilize them. But when there are laws in place like we have today, Section 504, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, various social security laws, Medicaid on and on, um, at least you meet somebody who knows about the law, they can tell you, oh, there, there is this law that could provide you with protections. But in the 40s, 50s and 60s, there were no such laws uh, at the federal level. And in some cases, there were some state or local laws, but typically, you know, in New York State, for example, while there was a law in the book that books that said uh, non-disabled children at that point started to go to school at five, um, the law was different for kids with disabilities. It was an older age, and I think it was six. But also there was clearly no vision that disabled children had a right to an equivalent education. So when my mother took me to school when I was five years old, 
And the principal said, no, I was a fire hazard. I couldn't go there, even though my parents were not asking for any supports from the school. Um, and the principal basically said, don't worry. The Board of Ed will send a teacher to your house. Well, the teacher to the house was twice a week, once for an hour, once for an hour and a half. So, you know, as they were kind of muddling through um, what that all meant and what to do, um, I wound up not getting into a program until I was nine, although my parents were you know, trying to figure out different ways for me to get into school. When I did go to school, I was only in classes for disabled children in a school that was mainly for non-disabled children. Uh, we didn't eat lunch together in the cafeteria. Um, eventually they built bathrooms in the classrooms, So we didn't even go to the bathroom with the non-disabled kids. We didn't eat lunch together. Although the cafeteria was down the hall, we didn't do gym together. Um, once a week in assembly, we would go to the assembly. So we came through separate doors. Uh, we left um, an hour earlier, half an hour to an hour earlier. We didn't use the same curricula. And, uh, you know, basically what we were learning when I finally did get into school was that expectations were not the same for us. And what I think was very important was that my parents and many other parents were really beginning to recognize that our just being in a school, in a classroom was insufficient, that they had expectations for us, that the system really didn't yet have expectations for us and so many others. And I think that really was very important for me, even at a young age, to be observing what my parents and other parents were doing to really uh, try to knock down barriers and uh, get like the Board of Education to uh, begin to take its responsibility of educating children who had disabilities more seriously. For sure. Um, and so you had talked in the book and you know, you've alluded to this, whether or not you felt socially included, but it's interesting because you pointed out in the conversation today about the importance of parents as advocates. So we did have a question asking about how um, schools can increase opportunities for individuals with disabilities to build friendships with peers, whether they have disabilities or not. But I'm also wondering how um, parents of children with disabilities might build alliances with other parents so that that advocacy is mainstreamed as well. I think there are many ways of looking at this. First of all, um, obviously making, you know, it depends on the setting. So are the children in segregated classes? Are they in segregated schools? Are they in inclusive schools? Are they in inclusive classrooms? Um, what is going on in the environment of the school? So one of the issues around NDEAM, which I think more and more people, well, it, the obvious is you don't want a month, a year, which focuses on any group. It should be in this case for ending a month, which allows people to an inventory of what has happened over the last year and what commitments need to be made over the future year. Um, that would be, in my view, the best way to use NDEAM sharing information uh, from other um, organizations about how they are integrating disability into the work they're doing, how they're dealing with issues of uh, recruitment advancement, uh, retention, what they're doing with their internship programs, their mentorship programs, looking at disability truly as a diverse issue. So disabled people with different disabilities, different racial backgrounds, sexual orientation, on and on. And is disability really being integrated within the organization, in this case, AIR, so that people are learning from disabled people, both in the workforce and with um, projects that you're running, what are experiences that people have? I think, you know, when looking at parents who have disabled children, um, there's very interesting work that could be done 
to really find out from parents whose kids are in various settings, what are their experiences? What are their experiences with um, receiving appropriate services under IDEA, under 504? Is bullying going on? What's going on in the school to address issues like that? Um, what are their children saying about how they feel accepted in the school? If these things are being done correctly, uh, one shouldn't really have to provide a lot of intervention on how children can become friends. Children become friends with each other when there are conducive environments. Um, there may be need with some children to really help ensure that people understand issues that are going on to help break down some of these barriers, particularly for families um, of non-disabled kids who may also be needing education. But I think if we're in an environment which is conducive and truly respectful, um, then I think learning about what some of the barriers may be to someone going to somebody's house, if the house isn't accessible and alternative ways of being able to get kids together. Are there activities going on after school and are the disabled kids able to really participate? Um, are there sign language interpreters available if someone is deaf or different ways that people, or is sign language being offered in the schools so that students who are deaf or hard of hearing and use sign language can be engaged. There's many, I think the teaching of disability history is so very important in elementary school, middle school, high school, even early childhood. What are the books that are in the library? Are those books reflective of learning around disability in a positive way um, in, in English classes, in history classes? Are we really ensuring that disability is being appropriately reflected. I think it's important for students and families and faculty and staff to really see that disability is an integral part of the work that's going on. And we need to be talking to people again, as I've said, about whether people feel this is going on, um, what changes need to be made and what leadership does the school need to be playing. No, I continue to be very concerned about the number of children who are not included in regular um, educational settings. Uh, the fact that there aren't as many teachers who have disabilities um, in the classroom as principals with visible and invisible disabilities, because I think, you know, as AIR understands, the ability for the leadership to be reflective of the diversity you're trying to advance is very meaningful. Just talking about things without being able to demonstrate what's actually happening, I think makes people feel like there's a lot of verbiage and not a lot of action. So I think fundamentally, those are some of the really critical issues we need to be looking at, talking to people. They're, you know, they're, more and more books that are coming out that are really diverse books for younger readers uh, that really both in pictures and in words are allowing people to see and learn about diversity in a very natural way. And I find it very interesting that younger people, you know, eight, eight to 12, 15 years old are really talking about why is disability not really being included um, why are we not learning this story? And I think, you know, more students with invisible disabilities are likewise speaking up about this. But there are too many um, children and parents who, in my view, have very legitimate concerns about what's going on in the schools um, in the area of representation of disability, um, that this needs to be focused on more. And, um, you know, we've been kind of implying or people might infer we're primarily talking right now about K through 12. Do you think I could see some of these issues are equally as applicable in higher ed or do you think there's another layer or a totally something I mean, that needs mm -hmm. higher ed likewise 
um, you know, you're we're seeing advancements in early childhood, primary, secondary, and higher education. No doubt about that. These laws have, unlike as I was saying, didn't exist when I was younger. When IDEA came about in 94, 142, um, in 1975, the government said there were a million disabled children out of school. You know, those types of acknowledgements. Uh, now, there should be no children out of school um, because of their disability. However, we know that in the area of juvenile justice, um, that 50 to 80 percent of children or young adults in juvenile facilities have disabilities. These children, in my view, by and large, were known to the schools. They were not served. They were allowed to drop out, kicked out, suspended, um, alternative education not provided. So there is this very significant group of people who have not been getting what they need and nobody has really been addressing these issues as they uh, need to be addressing them. Higher education, likewise, you know, again, I think what we're seeing is uh, disability studies happening on more campuses. UCLA, for example, this year finally has an interdisciplinary major in disability. Um, disabled services offices are, um, you know, they're a mixed breed. Uh, but the, the problems that students, faculty, and staff still face are ones that they should no longer be facing. But talking mm -hmm. about what should or shouldn't happen, what exists. So 1973, Section 504 came into being. Every institution of higher education, by law, has been supposedly addressing issues, both of physical access, as well as ensuring that faculty, staff, students are not being discriminated against. Um, for me, one of the issues in higher ed and other areas, but for the moment in higher ed, is the issue of accessibility is something that one should be able to take for granted, which clearly is not true. Um, and what I think has happened is that the need to look at the inclusion of disability in academic related areas is still far, far too behind. And, you know, students on campus with disabilities have difficulty organizing in many cases the students themselves are still grappling both in high school and in higher education with whether or not they want to disclose their disability. In part, Sorry, I think that is addressed at the university level. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In some universities where they will not accept the fact that a student has a disability without a lot of documentation, that they're not mm -hmm. going to pay in order for a student to be determined eligible for whatever their disability may be. In those schools, I think you really see students and others afraid of really speaking out. Um, but in schools where they're much more flexible on the kinds of supports they provide and don't require this onerous amount of work to be able to determine disability, you'll see a different environment on campus. Um, I think as the disability movement grows outside of the university, I also think it has an impact on university campuses. And I do think that films like Crip Camp, my book, Alice Wong's book, many other people's books, if they're being used in literature, if we're looking educationally at the inclusion of disability in diversity, I think that's very important more and more colleges are having these cultural centers, but not all the colleges mm -hmm. and universities that have cultural centers have cultural centers in the area of disability. And typically right. just like DEI, disability is not usually in the beginning, it's towards the end. And, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be speaking at UC Berkeley next week and the oh, cultural wow. center, which is opening up, is not reporting to the same person in the administration as the other cultural centers are reporting to. So, you know, they're little quick things that um, 
I will definitely be mentioning uh, that you can really get a better sense of the environment of the universities. But absolutely, universities, in my view, need to be enabling issues around disability, of which there are so many different themes. But nobody should be graduating from any in any major where issues affecting disabled people are not included. I mean, to me, that me that not only means that the students are not learning what they need to learn in order to be able, when they enter the world of work, to assist in putting a disability lens on whatever the company is that they're working with or government agency, whatever. Um, we really need to be looking at universities from, I mean, every vantage point, but they need to reflect what the society needs, the knowledge that the society needs. And if they're not learning it, if they're not, for example, coming out of school as educators, um, having taken more than one class addressing issues of disability, how do we expect them to be model teachers in inclusive classroom settings? How do we expect them to be able to move on to become principals and superintendents, um, having a vision of what inclusion means, what environment uh, needs to be created in the schools that they're leading? Totally agree. Um, so in the spirit of inclusion, we are going to turn now to see what kind of questions might be coming in from the audience. And we have Vanessa Batiste here with us to help out with that. Okay. Hey, Vanessa. Hi, Judy. How are you? Good. Good. My name is Vanessa Batiste. I'm the senior HR leave administrator, um, leave administration and compliance mm -hmm. manager. I am a black woman. I am wearing glasses. I have on a white turtleneck with silver and black necklace um, with a tan sweater. My hair is black. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am in the Crystal City corporate office today, um, and that is my background with the window. The first question I have for you, Judy, came in, um, and it's about the community. You speak a lot about the value of community. Are there organizations you would recommend that provides community empowerment and advocacy support? There are more organizations than I could possibly give, but um, so I think there are a number of ways of looking at this. If you're looking for national organizations, there's an organization called the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities. They represent about 120 national organizations, most of which are not run by disabled people, some of which are. Um, there are also organizations like the Parent Training Technical Assistance Centers, of which there are about 100 in the United States. Um, there's at least one in every state. So it would enable you to get a better understanding of what's going on in the area for parents. Um, there are organizations in, for learn, in the area of learning disabilities, mental health, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, National Association of the Blind, National Federation of the Deaf, the American Council of the Blind. There are and many, many state and local groups. So I think, um, groups like the American Association of People with Disabilities, which is not a membership organization, but it's based in Washington, DC, working in a lot of critical areas like voting. I'm on their board, um, group called the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, which is a um, an equivalent really to groups like the NAACP. Uh, it's in the uh, West Coast in California. I'm on their board too. Um, so I think the issue is, what are you interested in? Why do you want to be talking with these groups? And then also, I think frequently talking to people in the local community uh, to help identify some of the best groups. I think one of the other points I'd like to make, though, this is probably not in your question, but um, 
when AIR is looking at working with other organizations to advance whatever work you're doing, if you're doing subcontracting, for example, I think it's a very good idea to be looking at whether or not there are disability run organizations or in some case, parent run organizations that you could subcontract with, um, that you could get more involved both in the design of some of the applications that you're submitting for funding, as well as implementation of those grants and contracts. Okay, thank you for that. I have another question just that just came in. I am a graphic designer and create visual content for print in the web. Beyond meeting 508 compliance standards, are there other things I should consider that can improve accessibility? Hiring disabled people, um, knowing who disabled graphic designers are. Um, some places are um, contracting for people to come in and do reviews of websites to see if your websites are accessible. Um, those types of things can be very important, but ultimately making sure that your staff are knowledgeable about issues around accessibility. And uh, if they're not looking at what you need to do to get them trained. Okay, thank you. I have another question that came in. How does a young adult with disabilities get their foot in the door with their first job? It's a great question. Um, I think there are many ways to look at this. So at this school that this child or youth is attending, what is being done to help non-disabled students get their toe in the door for their first internship or for their first job? Are disabled students being included in those programs? If not, what needs to be done to make sure that they are? I think that's a very fundamental way of beginning. I think um, also there are companies looking for the companies or government agencies in your area that may have summer internship programs. So for example, when I was the director of the Department on Disability Services in the District of Columbia, um, the, the mayor then and the mayor still today have these summer internship programs for high school students. Um, what is being done to ensure that disabled high school students are a part of the internship programs? That means that there both needs to be someone who's in the leadership position for summer internship programs to uh, know that they need to be reaching, sorry, they need to be reaching out to bring disabled students in to the program and making sure that the supervisors and managers are reasonably knowledgeable about things like accommodations that a student may need not to, may need not to reject the student, but to ensure that the student, in fact, is being brought on and is given the supports that they need. But I think it's a great question because so very frequently, disabled students are not, for various reasons, getting the same opportunities. So they're not building their resume like others are building in their resumes. And it also gives them more limited opportunities to know what fields they wanna be going into when they're getting out of high school. Okay. And I think another very important issue is to be working with families and working with families from a very early age, so that there is an expectation that your disabled child should have the same opportunities as your non-disabled child or cousin or neighbor or whatever. Um, and that I think it relates to a question that someone asked earlier about parents, uh, it's if, if they're parent training associations um, in your school, are you in, are parents involved with the PTAs? I know they may have a new name now, but uh, are they involved with those organizations? Are they raising those kinds of questions uh, to make sure that disabled students are being fully integrated into the opportunities of the school that the school is offering? Then there are also many other organizations like we were discussing a minute ago, and some of those organizations could be very helpful in 
looking at opportunities, but typically like for a high school student, you may be looking at a local level. There's, I mentioned a minute ago, the American Association of People with Disabilities. Now they have a summer internship program where they select about 15 or 20, maybe 25 disabled college students to come to spend um, like eight weeks, 10 weeks here. Uh, they live on campus at GW and they do internships. So there are more and more of these programs. The Department of Labor has a program for uh, disabled high school students to come in, sorry, disabled college students uh, to come and work in Washington in various government offices for internship programs. And you know, there are many organizations uh, not exclusively focusing on disability that are working on uh, in summer internship programs, learning about which groups are doing that and how they are recruiting and integrating disabled people into those programs because more and more of them are doing this is important. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know if we have time for one more question because I have one that just came in. Is there a good place to find jobs for disabled? And you touched a little bit on that. For example, you mentioned visually impaired people helping check accessibility on websites. How would you find those jobs? I think what's important is not to think about the type of disability that somebody has, but it's really important to find out what that person's interests may be. Mm -hmm. um, just like when we're working with any minority group, you're really trying to help ensure that those individuals are getting a decent education and that we can be working uh, with students to really explore the areas of employment that they're interested in. Like all of us knowing that these things may change many times over the course of our life. Um, so I don't want to pigeonhole and say someone is blind, therefore they should be a tester. But you wanna make sure that people who are blind, as an example, are being given opportunities uh, like non-disabled people in early childhood, primary, secondary education to be utilizing technology. So to make sure the technology that's in the school is accessible for all students, not just blind and low vision, but students who have other forms of disabilities. And that students at the university, community college level, whatever it may be, technical training programs are not being excluded from participating in programs because they have a particular disability. This really means that we must be doing a much better job of evaluating these types of programs to make sure that uh, disabled individuals, including their staff, um, are not experiencing biases that make it more difficult for them either to perform their jobs or to be able to come into a program where people are being trained. The other thing is that there are many, as I was mentioning earlier, organizations um, where if you're particularly interested in a group of people, for example, who are blind, you can go and speak to those organizations and talk with them. But I think, you know, what's really important is the laws that we now have on the books are intended to make sure that people um, are not pigeonholed. Unlike countries like China and countries in Asia, where blind people were ushered into jobs as acupuncturists, as masseuses, because they couldn't see, but they could feel, um, and they were excluded from getting jobs in a broad variety of areas. You know, we, we don't wanna be replicating that. True, thank you. Well, thank you so much for answering the questions that came in, Judy. I'm gonna hand it back off to Kathleen. Thank thanks, you. Vanessa. Thank, thanks, Vanessa. Uh, thanks for handling all those questions on the fly, Judy. Um, so when I was going through registration questions, um, and it's come up here and some that we didn't get to yet, 
there's a lot of interest in what sometimes people call in invisible disabilities. You know, we've got now long COVID or um, chemical sensitivities, mental health is huge. And um, all of these can create situations where employees can be more productive when employers are flexible about how or when or where work is done. So what strategies have you seen that you think really move the needle on prioritizing accessibility, especially for people with these invisible disabilities or reasonable accommodations as you know, we know them under the Americans with Disabilities Act? I mean, personally, I feel that as we're making adjustments in the way we work, that we need to be listening to what our employees need. Um, and but I have to say that I am very much in support of people being together. So I think it is the exception to the rule that someone needs to work 100% at home. And I'm not saying that obviously there are people who uh, need those kinds of accommodation and they should be able to get those accommodations. But I think there shouldn't be a presumption that disabled people wish to work at home, uh, wish not to come into the workforce. Um, I think there are a number of issues around accommodations where it may be more difficult for people to get their accommodations at home and that companies really need to look at, for example, if, if you have a blind employee who's working at home and they need a reader, can that reader, will you allow that reader to work in that person's home? Um, if someone needs a personal assistant uh, to help go to the bathroom or do other things during the working period, uh, will you allow people to go into people's homes? Uh, are you providing those kinds of support on the work site? So I think we're in a very learning mode. I wanna say that that's what I think is the most important. Some of the issues around mental health have also come about because of the isolation of COVID and people not being together. Issues that people discuss um, is if they're new employees, not being able to meet people within the company, not being able to socialize both for work as well as socialization. So I don't think there's an easy answer, but for me, one of the premises needs to be, one, all disabled people do not wish to work at home all the time. We need to make sure that we are listening to the needs of our employees and allowing people to be working at home uh, when it is what they need to do. And it's usually not an either or situation where someone has to be 100% at home or 100% at work you know, being able to be flexible about this. And I think to look at what's trending and what's going on uh, to make sure that we're conscious of this. I wanna say, you know, in the area of long-term COVID, I had polio and um, of course the data that you have now, we ha have now are getting in COVID was not available with polio, but there are le many, many people probably at least in the millions, who had what you could have called long-term polio. You know, who had polio, they didn't necessarily know they had it or they had it, but it didn't have a very significant impact on them immediately. But then years down the road, began having various problems with muscles and other things. So um, I think looking at other disabilities and what happened with other people, i.e. with polio, but other conditions too, is very important. What I think is very important about long-term COVID is that we need to be looking at what those people need to be able to maintain an active life, to be able to understand what services are out there and to be excuse me, I got the hiccup, and to be able to have access to those services. So if someone needs personal assistance services, are they able to get it? And they may not need it all the time. They may need it sometimes. Um, if they may no longer be able to do their job, but may need to be retrained, 
where is that going to happen? Are agencies like the Departments of Rehabilitation being given the financial support they need to be able to reach out to this uh, new group? But I would say that, you know, <laughs> people with cancer, people with multiple sclerosis, people with Parkinson's disease, on and on, these conditions may be progressive. Someone may not have had a disability. They may now have whatever disability they have. It may stay stagnant, but it also may progress. And all of these people are needing the kinds of supports in order to be able to live an active, productive life. And our systems, in my view, too frequently are not functioning together in order to make sure that people are not falling through the cracks. So right now, we're looking at people who have an effect from COVID, whether or not that means they're going to be able to get the supports they need, I don't know. Um, but I think that's really the question. Are they going to be getting what they need to be able to maintain a life um, similar to the one they had before they had COVID or completely like the life they had before they had COVID? because we don't know how long the effects are going to last. Mm -hmm. Or at least as good as everyone else's new normal, right? Um, so you're, you've been able to work in a lot of different settings and not a lot of people like you have been able to work at the World Bank or internationally. And you know, you're talking about systems. So are there ways that it's working better in other countries? Are there things we should be aware of or practices we could be adopting that we're not? I think we need to, um, hi, Linda Thomas Barker. I just turned on the questions. <laughs> How are you? Um, I think it's well worth looking at other countries all the time to look at what they're doing, to what they're doing in higher education, to what they're doing in employment, uh, what they're doing, um, in the area of things like accessibility, working with people who have different forms of disabilities. One of the big issues I think for me is how many countries have much better healthcare systems than we do. And I would say that's one of the areas that we continue not to excel in. Um, not everyone having health insurance um, is obviously a major problem, including uh, affecting people who may now be acquiring disabilities because they're not getting the health care that they need, or for people who have disabilities, not getting the health care that they need in order to be able to um, continue to do whatever it was they were doing before. Um, is, you know, issues of accessibility, some countries are much better if people need their homes modified in being able to get money to modify their homes. Uh, so there are various issues. But I think, you know, globally speaking, what we have been seeing is a continually advancing disability rights movement, um, which is benefiting and learning from each other. And I think, you know, groups like the International Disability Alliance, uh, which is working with countries around the world and 13 uh, international organizations. Those are groups that we can really look on to get a better understanding of how things are going in different countries. See you tomorrow. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about that's a new form of diversity among social movements everywhere. So if you think, back, and I did see Linda Toms Barker's question here about um, thinking about advocacy over the years and disability rights. It, you talk a little bit, um, there are great examples actually in your book about collaboration, you know, the Black Panthers coming in and helping during your sit-in, but disability, as has been stated earlier in the, the session here, hasn't always really been included in this equity equation, and um, I think that's why ending has that theme this year. So do you know, like, what's your sense? Why does it get left out? What do we need to do differently to make sure it's a part of the 
equation. I'm sorry, could you say it again, please? It, are there suggestions you have about trying to get more awareness about how disability actually is part of diversity, I think equity, we need inclusion, to get rid efforts? Of the word awareness. Okay. Because to me, the word awareness doesn't mean a lot. I'm aware that you have blonde hair to your shoulders, but I forget it the next second. So to me, it's what is it that we need to be looking at uh, for people with various forms of disabilities in order to make sure that we are effectively able to put a disability lens on whatever the work is that we're doing. And it needs to move away from awareness to meaningful knowledge, to holding ourselves accountable. Um, you know, one of the things that I think I was mentioning earlier is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. A, we should get rid of the word awareness. And in my view, it really should be looked at as what have we as an individual entity done that is advancing us from where we were last year? And what are we establishing as goals and priorities for next year? And how are we holding ourselves accountable? Um, that's what I think needs to be done. What are we doing to educate our staff? What are we doing to inform entities that we're getting money from to make changes about what we see working and not working? How do we take the work that we're doing and have a greater influence where appropriate on making changes when we see things that aren't happening that are contrary to what we believe should be happening. So I think awareness, like the word special, should be gotten rid of um, because I, I just really feel, if you only feel like you need to be aware of who I am, that, that doesn't cut it. You know, if you're not aware, if you really understand that Judy uses a wheelchair and we need to make sure that she can get wherever it is we're going. And that includes not only no steps, but it also includes an accessible bathroom or someone who's deaf or someone who has autism, whatever the issue disability may be, uh, we need to go beyond awareness. We need to be able to say, I am more knowledgeable. I've had conversations with, I'm working with, with NR, whatever it is, we have done an inventory. We're making meaningful changes. This is where we are today. This is where we're looking at going. I think educating, educating, educating is really what enables people to move away from a very limited awareness. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Um, so thinking through we like what- women, We don't want people to be aware of us, right? right. We want right. them to say, oh, are they being paid less money than a male equivalent? That's not awareness. That's mm -hmm. substantively saying, okay, I'm hearing from our employees that men and women are earning different amounts of money for the same job. Or whether we're, you know, we know, for example, that if you look at data, um, women make less money than men. Mm -hmm. Black women make less money than white women. Black disabled women make less money than uh, Black non-disabled women, on and on. So these are things that we need to be calling it knowledge acquisition and changes that we want to make where we see things are not as they should be. So what do you think would be really priorities as far as educating? What are the top topics? I think you need... So the Ford Foundation, uh, when Darren Walker in 2016 uh, really began to integrate disability into the work they were doing, I think did some very meaningful things. Um, they have staff that um, were really, now they have two full-time staff that are looking at disability related issues, but it's gone much beyond that. So one of those people, um, does work programmatically. The other one has been working across the organization for another oh, four or five years now on really um, bringing people in to do training on disability, cultural training related issues, 
looking at the work that they're doing, getting a better understanding of how to be integrating disability into their grant making. Um, so I, I like Ford and the work they've done. They're much smaller than you are and they have a different um, purpose. But I, I think looking at what you've done in gender and race, um, are there educational activities that you have going on to help people learn more about what discrepancies exist with, within various communities and what you're doing to train staff, recruit staff, that's what I think needs to happen. It needs to be a serious effort where people are really buying into it and understanding that um, the organization is on a path to really make significant changes where disability, broadly speaking, is something that will go beyond awareness. But people working at AAR will be seen as leaders and people of knowledge in the field. Yeah, and we definitely uh, are all about putting evidence into action, not just making people aware. Exactly. Um, I think so that's a very important point, Kathleen, also, uh, when looking at evidence from a research perspective. So, you know, getting a better understanding of where people are now, what their knowledge is, what areas people feel they need to learn more. I mean, honestly, some of the questions that were just asked, I appreciate them, but they are very, very, very basic questions. And so it seems to me that there's a need for people to have more knowledge, you know, for example, on what resources exist in the states that you're working in, the communities that you're working in, who are groups that you can be speaking with bringing people in to do, you know, lunch discussions, um, books that people could be reading, really seriously looking at not just the projects that you're running that are disability focused, but the projects that you're running that are not disability focused exactly. and how disability should be integrated. What would that look like? How do you do it? How do you measure it? Um, you know, that's what I'm saying. If if a disability lens is put on everything that's happening within an organization over a number of years, I think we can see some fundamental changes, not only within the organization, but within the work that they're doing. Right. And of course, that's one reason why we're doing this event, right? Because it's drawing a broad audience, you know, beyond just kind of the champions of disability. Um, so I am going to turn to Vanessa now so that. There, as I said, there are some immediate questions coming in so that we can include those voices as well to the degree we're able. Thank you so much, Judy. It's great to see have this conversation. Hi, Judy. So I have some questions that just came in. And one of them um, is, how have you seen the understanding of disability as including invisible disabilities, such as chronic pain, chronic fatigue syndrome, long COVID, multiple chem chemical sensitivities, et cetera, changed over time and impacted and changed your priorities and approach in advocacy? I think what's very important is that people who have the various disabilities that you're discussing can begin to identify as having a disability. Because for me, what is very important is that we come under an umbrella. And that umbrella needs to be broadly understanding of how various disabilities impact people. And we need to be able to be advocating for each other, uh, both internally within the groups that we're working with. And, you know, for example, people may have chronic pain or chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, or multiple chemical sensitivities, or depression, or anxiety, or attention deficit disorder, or autism, or many other types of disabilities. But if they are not speaking up about them, that's an issue. Now, I'm not criticizing the people who aren't speaking up, because in many ways, we need to be in environments where people feel like 
it is acceptable and there won't be negative implications for having these types of discussions. But I think we need, as I said earlier, many people have invisible disabilities. Because of the stigma of disability, people frequently are not discussing it or they're afraid to discuss it because they're not going to get the accommodations that they need. You know, we're looking at changing the culture and environment of organizations where people can have these discussions. So if someone is having a bad day, um, you know, they can discuss it and talk about what it is they need uh, to be able to function effectively on that day or have a certain kind of an accommodation that uh, may be helpful to them. But I think the most important thing, or I don't want to say the most, but an important thing is to be able to bring your whole self to wherever you are, whether it's with your family, in the community, in business, um, being able to allow people to understand things like chemical sensitivities. That means people should not be wearing certain kinds of products. It means that we should not be bringing certain things into our environment. But if people don't speak about it, um, it's difficult. And even, I don't want to put um, the total responsibility on those of us with disabilities, which is why I'm talking about the need to be able to work as effectively as possible in coalition so that we as a community are able to talk about people who have different types of disabilities and how those disabilities may impact them. And I think, you know, the reality is, you know, we can be a pretty flexible group. Um, we're a good, frequently problem-solving group of people because things can change in a second in some of the daily activities that we're involved with. Okay, thank you. The next question I is- answer the question? Whoever asked the question, can I somehow know whether my response was, is that you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Linda's question, we made great strides in disability rights and access during the 70s and 80s. In what ways has some of that progress been challenged and backsliding or losses in rights or accessibility? Um, I think we have to be really concerned about some of the court cases um, that have been advancing, um, some of which we've been able to get pulled back uh, where the right of individual people to file complaints is being challenged as an example. Um, CVS, LA College, LA uh, Community College District um, was sued by a group of blind people because of lack of accessibility. And LA Community College, this is like one of the most diverse parts of the country had gone forward trying to get um, a case before the US Supreme Court that the court, if the case went forward, would have ruled against issues around accessibility. I mean, these are things that we have to be concerned about. Obviously, Roe versus Wade and the decision that came down is detrimental to many, including disabled individuals. And I think this question speaks to the need for the disability community to be, and the need for other civil rights communities to recognize that disability, disabled people are impacted on all these issues. So abortion as a, a very critical issue, um, denying disabled individuals the right to appropriate health care um, is something that we have to be included in that discussion because it has great implications for disabled women, as an example. Okay. Another question came in. Every member of AIR's distributive workforce interacts on teams including remote employees, if not teleworking part-time or working or remotely full-time. As the chair of AIR's employee resource group for remote workers, I'm considering the intersectionality of those working remotely who identify as disabled. 
Do you have any suggestions on how to support them? I'm not exactly. I think, Deirdre, you know, what's important is to be learning from them how they feel they're not being supported and what needs to be done to give them the support that they need, including flexibility of when they're working remotely and not. Um, I think the ability, and I'm sure you're doing this already, the ability for people to be able to come together and talk about some of these issues and having HR really involved in these discussions. I think all of this is important. So I guess you really, the bottom line Deirdre, is what are the issues that they're raising and what's the best way to try to address them? Um, that's clearly very important. And I know you know that, to be able to find out what the problems are. I have worked in early intervention and special ed research in TA for close to 30 years and have two godchildren with autism. I'm still astounded by how much advocacy parents need to engage in to get FAPE. How can we move the system beyond the squeaky wheel paradigm? <clears throat> Thank you. Is it Talitha? Um, it is what I was saying earlier. It's astounding. And it means that the it, it means many things. Um, on the one hand, your godchildren are fortunate that there are family members who understand what their rights are and can be fighting for fate. Um, on the other hand, it speaks to so many other families who, even if they know about it, what FAPE is, FAPE is free appropriate public education. Um, don't necessarily have the knowledge to be able to address these issues. Um, families can go into these parent training or parent in the IEP meetings, for example, and it could be one of them and a number of other people. And, you know, I think those can be quite problematic. Families need to know their rights. Frequently, they need to bring somebody with them in order to be able to ensure that the other side also understands that they need business too. Um, but the bottom line is organizations, um, both the federal government, state government, local school district, parent organizations, disability rights groups, the point that you're making here is how astounding it is that this is still a problem to the magnitude that it is. And how do we bring attention to this? You're a woman in the field for 30 years. You understand what should be being done. I think part of it is lack of appropriate training, lack of appropriate accountability, um, leadership in school districts, not addressing these issues. And um, I think it's also a bigger question of how we're supporting public education in general. And um, these, I think, are very important issues, but in a little way, um, you know, your voice being able to raise some of these issues, both within uh, AIR, if AIR is doing work in this area, but um, in the community, I think is important. And I think one of the issues is, you know, if you don't have, it gets back to what I was saying in the beginning about myself. If the community doesn't have an expectation that one is going to benefit, if there is a bias that if you have autism or if you can't walk or if you can't see or if you have Tourette's or if you, whatever, if, you know, you are not as valued as somebody else, then, you know, with limited resources, why are we giving you some of this money? And um, that's why I think we need to move away from awareness and we really need to be uh, much more vocal and demanding about the changes that we need to be making. Well, before we close, Judy, we have one more question. Who inspires you most in life? Say it again. Who inspires you most inspires in life? Other people. Okay. Fighters. I always think about my parents, but, you know, it's, um, it's all of us. And the people who are out there every day 
really uh, not accepting the status quo. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Judy, for being with us today. We really appreciated having you on. Um, so I'm ready to close now. And um, I just wanna say thank you again to Judith Human for sharing her insights and Kathleen Murphy for leading the conversation. Also want to thank our audience for being here with us for this important conversation and sharing your questions. I hope that something stuck with you that you can take back and apply to your work or personal life. This event was, was sponsored by Access AIR, an employee resource group with the mission of promoting a work environment that's inclusive of and responsive to people with disabilities, their families and the communities AIR serves. Our employee resource groups are supported by AIR's Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and we thank them for their partnership on this event. A special thank you to David Osher, AIR, Vice President and Institute Fellow Youth Family and Community who helped orchestrate this event. Thank you again to everyone who joined us and have a great evening. David, Judy, would you like to say something? I just want to thank Judy. Um, Absolutely. The comments about awareness, um, it really struck home. Uh, I happen to have two grandsons with ADHD and both on the autism spectrum. And so many of the things you said today really touched me. So thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me. Take care, everybody. Talk again. All right. Thank you thank so much. You.